Hi, my name's George Stobart. I am Nicole Collard from La Liberté. What's that, some kind of nightclub? Do you remember? It was 1996 and the gaming world was surprised by a small British team called Revolution Software and its awesome epic adventure game Broken Sword, The Shadow of the Templars, a game that shocked with, at that time, outstanding animated graphics and particularly with a sophisticated mystical story revealing an ancient mystery of the Knights Templar. I would like to think that Broken Sword takes a lot of credit for creating the idea of the Knights Templar going into the zeitgeist of culture. Uh, obviously Dan Brown took and many ideas that we had, whether he'd played Broken Sword or not beforehand is an interesting question, but a lot of people think he must have done. Um, and, but the, the whole Knights Templar now feels almost cliched, which is strange really, because you know, we, we really drove it into the mainstream in many ways with Broken Sword, yeah. and we need to move forward. The legendary series started with the Knights Templar topic and continued on with Mayan mythology, the secret of the Voynich Manuscript, and then the Biblical Ark of the Covenant. Which topic will the recently announced sequel, The Serpent's Curse, focus on? In general, the, the subject that I really love is the Gnostics and the Gnostic Gospels and how that relates to uh, disciples like Mary Magdalene, and the destruction of the Gnostics, the Cathars in the 13th century, and that how that resonates back in. And also the idea of Lucifer as the bringer of light or the devil, and all of these ideas. Um, the idea that right from the very beginning, you had two groups of disciples. You had the Gnostics and you had the Orthodox. And what I think was fascinating was in 1937, um, all of these Gnostic Gospels were discovered and they had a very interesting slant. So we take a lot of that mythology and of course it resonates into the present day and the game starts with George and Nico happening to meet by chance, or it feels like chance, um, at a painting uh, exhibition in Paris. And there's a seemingly very unimportant painting. A gunman bursts in, shoots, murders the, um, the owner of the, uh, the gallery, steals the painting, and it turns out that actually both George and Nico are drawn into this much, much wider and much larger conspiracy, but they're brought in from different angles. Paris in the spring, the scent of blossom on the soft breeze, love was in the air, life was good. Nico and I had met again by chance at an art show. The evening stretched ahead. I was about to suggest dinner when fate intervened in the shape of a pizza guy with a gun. He took a life and he stole a painting that was worth little and meant even less. Or so I thought. Why did he have to kill him, Georges? What's going on? I don't know, but we're gonna find out. What you can see here is that you've got the new George and Nico. You can see that we've got high res. We've very much gone for the painted background. We've gone for, you know, 2D sprites. So what we do is we set up the scenario where George is, you know, determined to get to the bottom. Uh, Nico turns around and she says, why did they do it, George? So we've set up a classic broken sword moment, and then you'll see the joke. And cut. Perfect. <gasps> Terrific work, guys. Thanks, everyone. That's a wrap. So what we've got is we've got all the team members there uh -huh. operating the boom and the camera and everything. What, 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 I'm, what I'm thrilled by is that, you know, this is the, very much the 2D look. Mm -hmm. We are rendering them in 3D because it's high, you know, you can see it's high definition. It's the only way that we can do it. But, but you know, we have a, a very complex rendering process, so they're, pr they're, they're processed offline, stored as sprites, so it feels very much like it's a 2D game. It is very much a 2D game. So we're very much returning to our roots. And we've got, you know, we've got some fantastic artists, we've got a wonderful 2D artist who's come to join us, who, the interesting thing about it, it's very difficult to find classical layout artists, because of course, everything's 3D now. So we've got the situation where, actually layout artists, classical layout artists, find it difficult to get work, and so there are fewer of them. 
And so we find it harder to get really good ones. But we, we have a wonderful, we have a wonderful layout artist. You know, she's young and she's worked, you know, from Disney and um, and and Fox and you know all over the place. So it's just it's just great, and it just makes all the difference because obviously, you know, in, in in a game you're spending a lot of time looking at the background, yeah. whereas in a film the background really supports the characters. Mm -hmm. In a game, in many ways, it's the other way around, or they have equal prominence. You have so some little time. Yeah. So, so a lot of for, for layout artists, it's really satisfying because their layouts are much more important in a game than the equivalent layout would be in a in a, in a cartoon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Visually, the new Broken Sword game looks like the first or the second part of the series. But how about the gameplay? Will the developers stick to the classic point-and-click principles, or are they about to bring forth something new? Okay, a bit of both. Uh -huh. So it is absolutely classical point and click or swipe and touch. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I really liked the mini, most of the mini games that we had in the game, I thought worked well. So all, all the first person close, I mean the, the gate puzzle didn't work because it felt a little bit out of context. But you know, for example, when you're moving the, I don't know if you played Director's Cut, but when you're moving the glass round, you, you move different bits of stained glass and there's the excitement of this image coming, and that's very tactile. Mm -hmm. um, also, you have we have codes where you go in and you decipher codes, and again, that's a, a little mini game. Where the mini games are in context, then actually, I think it adds a lot, particularly to the touch screen, because the wonderful thing about touch screen is is the tactility of actually directly interacting through your finger with the backgrounds and the gameplay. So, it's it's going to feel very much like. The earlier Broken Swords, it, it is because it's 2D. Yeah. It's going to feel very point and click. But we, of course, do have mechanics. But we've worked very hard to make sure that what we add enhances the gameplay. But we have knowledge mm -hmm. because rather than reading a diary, which is dull, we also have icons which. Are, and I don't want to t t talk too much about it, but but actually, what you know comes up as icons as well, and you can manipulate that as well. Mm -hmm. So you know that's one of the innovations that we've added. Mm -hmm. But it's adding on to the existing point and click which works really well with the icons you know we know that that works so why change it uh -huh. we just want to add on to it and add new features that that take that a little bit further yeah. the characteristic feature of the broken sword series is adventurous traveling to various mysterious and exotic locations the first part used Paris as some kind of base to which George and Nico returned from each of their trips the second game though lacked a base camp what about the serpent's curse from this point of view it's halfway between, yes, yeah, yeah. So you do have bases, and what I felt worked better in Broken Sword 1 than Broken Sword 2 was the ability, the freedom in Paris to go to four or five locations and, and find that things have changed. And um, So we very much want to replicate that, the idea of change. Change because time has passed, because the player has achieved certain things and people have changed, gone. Um, but at the same time, we wanted to move it a bit faster. Um, Broken Sword 1 moved quite slowly, um, particularly in that first bit. Uh, I mean, a lot of people will almost certainly disagree, but when we wrote the director's cut, I, I put in the help idea. And the help idea was put in very deliberately so that we could have a wide range of players. Because the hardcore players, who used to enjoy really frustrating puzzles, you know, would enjoy the game as, as, as a hardcore game. But then somebody who just wanted to play it, it's like an interactive narrative with a bit of challenge, and whenever they got stuck, they just wanted to look up the answers. And actually, it worked really well. What we do is we, um, we record the number of hints. And every time you save a game, we say, look, OK, you've got. And if you don't care, you don't care how many hints. Yeah. But if you do, then you see each time there's a save game, it's got zero. And we open up a special reward for if you play the game through and you have zero hints. So what we're trying to do is write the game for as wide a range as possible. Although hearsay about the development of the new Broken Sword game has been spreading through the internet since December 2010, when the British Pocket Gamer was the first to break the news, Charles Cecil officially announced the game at Gamescom as late as this summer. At what phase is the game's development right now, knowing that Revolution Software has been working on it for more than a year? I, I've been thinking about it for a year. I've been thinking about it for a year. And when, with the success of Broken Sword on iPhone, 
we decided that we should do Android versions as well and other versions. So quite a lot of our resource, because we're a very small company, quite a lot of our resource went into the Android version, which was great for me because it meant I could keep thinking about the story. Because we've had the time, we've been working on the game for six months and we haven't had the pressures that we would have had under the normal regime of a publisher and retailers and knowing the release dates. So we've, we've actually been very relaxed about it. And now that we're, you know, well, a good part into it, now is the time that we're obviously um, feeling that we need to then work out how the rest of the funding is going to work, which is why we're launching the Kickstarter project. Charles Cecil has joined Tim Schaefer, Jane Jensen, and Chris Jones, who made their big comeback through the so-called crowdfunding. But isn't the first wave of the Kickstarter ecstasy over? And aren't the players much more careful about which projects they're willing to back now? Um, perhaps we should have gone earlier, but I, what I was very keen was to show people that the game was real. And we weren't in a position to do this a month or two months ago because we were working on the Game Design Bible and we weren't working on any final assets. Uh, what will happen with Kickstarter is that there will be a lot of projects that go catastrophically wrong. There's no question about it. And then the bubble will burst. There is no question that Broken Sword will be finished and it will be at this quality. And I hope that people will really like it. So I, I would expect that people will have a slightly different view towards Broken Sword. You know, all those other games are very speculative. Even Double Fine, you know, Tim Schafer, brilliant. He says, give me the money and I'll write you an adventure. Yeah. You know, we've got a different message. You didn't promise anything. No, we're saying, these are the graphics, this is what it'll look like. Mm -hmm. Don't, it's not so much a speculation, it's pre-order it. It's almost like saying pre-order it. Pre-order pre it now, and if you want the box copy to be sent to you, then you pay a bit more. And if you want to come to our wrap party at the end, then you pay a lot more. And, but at the basic level, if you're, you're, you're effectively pre-ordering the game, and that provides the funding for us to then finish it. Today, we already know that Revolution Software was successful in the Kickstarter campaign. Instead of the requested $400,000, the backers pledged almost twice as much. This allows the developers to realize their wildest dreams with the game, as they themselves say. People can still pledge through PayPal and help the developers to achieve their biggest aim, which is the green light for the development of Beneath a Steel Sky 2. But that's an issue for the faraway future. For now, let's set our eyes on April 2013 when The Serpent's Curse should be released, at least according to, as he refers to himself, the insanely optimistic Charles Cecil. And the other thing is, it's been a real pleasure to write. You know, in truth, three and four were done under real duress. We had very tight budgets, very tight time, time constraints. Um, what's lovely is, is the freedom, you know, the freedom to, to develop at our own rate. I mean, obviously as fast as possible, but you know, I, I, I obviously now have the power to stop the point of development until it's absolutely right. The problem is that all those wrinkles that you build up then come at the end, and the end is ultimately unsatisfying. So I very much hope that we won't have any of those wrinkles because we've sp spent an awful lot of time thinking about the story and how, how it should work so that we have a very interesting and exciting climactic ending. Yeah.